Welcome to Theories and Problems in Visual Art. This is lecture 10 in the history series on the subject, How Museums Tell the History of Modernism. Because stories of modern art and postmodern art um, are not told only in books, but also by galleries and the way that they're arranged. So I have a couple of slides to introduce that. I'm gonna spend most of this talk on the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, uh, because for a number of decades, that was the model for museums around the world and how to tell what they hoped was a canonical version um, of modernism and postmodernism, which had very wide influence um, in the art world, in academia, uh, and in other museums and galleries. So first by way of introduction, any museum that has a large enough collection, has enough art in it, has the option of telling a story of the art of the periods that it represents. Um, so that as you walk through, you're given a narrative about history. Sometimes that's uh, actually spelled out in the wall text, but most of the time it's implicit. Either there's a sequence of galleries that you're supposed to walk through or that you're given an option to walk through, or else uh, there are just numbered galleries. Um, so it could be um, subtle or it can be uh, really in your face, the story. And for a while in the Museum of Modern Art, it was very explicit. Most modern art museums uh, have chosen not to tell stories, especially museums of contemporary art. They tend to arrange their collections by theme and uh, in various ways that are not chronological. Uh, but the Museum of Modern Art was the main counterexample of that. It was the main exemplar of this um, standard issue of uh, a standard um, um, uh, way of defining what modernism was. As you walked through, you were taken past principal artists and movements all the way up to postmodernism. There are various ways of describing that story, just in general terms. It was centered on Western Europe and North America, so modern art in particular outside of those areas was um, marginalized or absent. Um, it was centered on white male artists and on painting, drawing, and sculpture. And it was committed at all points to the avant-garde, which in this case meant art that was challenging or difficult, ambiguous, serious, historically ambitious. It would be possible to do a whole seminar or a whole course on each one of those words, um, and they lead in many different directions. But in general, these are uh, values which are still very much with us, um, even in postmodern contemporary um, art and definitely in academia and academic art instruction, art that isn't any of these things re is still marginalized. Um, and the Museum of Modern Art um, is the was the most eloquent, uh, the most uh, are the most persistent uh, advocate of some of these kinds of values and of the modernism that they represented. So this the story of modernism that MoMA presented is the one that's still in most textbooks, and it's the one that leads to the postmodernism that everybody teaches in uh, classes on the 1960s, performance art, video, political art, and minimalism. There are other ways of talking about the art of the last 100 years, um, but in outline, this is the one um, that MoMA exemplified. So in the last decade, MoMA has given up telling that story, and since 2019, um, it's made a radical shift um, to, um, to uh, erase that story from its galleries. So I'm going to concentrate for the rest of the time just on MoMA in order to specify these things I've been talking about. Okay, so for the purposes of this, I'm going to divide MoMA into four periods. The first period would be from the year that it was founded, which is 1929, um, to 1968. And that's when the curator, Alfred Barr, left the institution. Barr was a uh, very influential um, and innovative curator uh, from the beginning, uh, with less and less influence as the decades went by. And it's interesting, actually, they left in 1968, which is a, a key uh, date that will come up a number of times in these uh, history lectures. With that, 1929 to 1968 is a convenient first period for MoMA. A second period would be from 1968 to November 2004, and that's when the architect Taniguchi's new building, the new extension to MoMA, opened. The third period would be the period of the Taniguchi building, 2004 to 2019. Building is still open, but now there's another extension, uh, a renovation, opened in 2019, and that was um, overseen by the architect Liz Diller. Each of these four, 
can be associated with a period, a curatorial period. And when you study um, large museums, um, it's always a good idea to have a sense of the history of their curations and their departments, their curators and their departments. In this case, each one of these four periods um, was, can be associated with different kinds of exhibitions. So the first period was very experimental. They were showing tribal art um, and they were following Picasso and Brock and other first generation modernists in that interest in uh, tribal art. They were also showing American self-taught art, which was later called outsider art. That was quite an unusual thing to do for, uh, for a museum of any kind, modern art or other. In the second period, there was a consolidation of the Eurocentric North American quote unquote master narrative, um, the, the canonical story uh, that has ended up in textbooks. Um, and also that was a period of the, uh, that included the magazine October, which is one of the principal um, vehicles or mouthpieces for the scholarship that surrounds the narrative that MoMA exemplifies. Uh, the third period is the dilution of that same master narrative by the inclusion of um, art from outside the central uh, countries and narratives and so on. And the fourth period is the sudden arrival of multiculturalism and the absolute end, possibly, of that narrative. Here's one of the um, printouts uh, of the, of, it's, it's of the um, place that MoMA has on the block in Manhattan um, between um, 5th and 6th Avenue. And you could see that in the first period, 1929 to 1968, it was just a little building. Um, and the Taniguchi building is a large uh, extension. It keeps buying more and more of the block that it's on. So you could also study this from a, um, from a uh, real estate perspective if you wanted to. The more and more of the land is necessary to, to show this collection in this way. Um, okay, so this is uh, a floor plan that was given to visitors um, in 2010. Um, and I'm going to use it as an example of the third period, that's the dilution of the narrative in the Taniguchi buildings. Uh, so when you came as a visitor in spring 2010, you would be handed this map, and if you asked, you would be told that the exhibition begins in gallery number one. And if you didn't, you might just see the number one and go up there. So um, it, wasn't, it wasn't that everyone ha had to begin there, but there was a narrative strongly suggested by the maps. When you entered that door, you would be facing a little uh, small partition wall, which you see right there past the arrow. And on the partition wall, you would see the Cezanne bather. It's a movable partition wall um, and it has space. It had space on either side. So it would be uh, directly facing you and blocking, as it were, um, the further galleries until you would pass it. From there, the implicit narrative continued to the right into gallery two. So I'll show you the Cezanne bather, there it is, that opened the modern galleries um, as it did before the 2004 renovation. This was the gateway or portal or the talisman or the icon of the entire collection of the Museum of Modern Art. Um, and there was a lot of debate uh, before the Taniguchi um, building opened um, and during several rehangs about what could possibly be put in the place of this painting. This is their figure one, as it were, like it's a figure one in an art history textbook. During one of those discussions, the curators um, entertained the possibility of putting this painting in instead of the Cezanne. This is um, Paul Signac's portrait of the art critic, Felix Fenion. Would have been a really, really interesting and eccentric choice. Um, I don't know if conversations about the reasoning for this have ever been made public, um, but if it had been put in, it certainly would have pointed past the kind of sober modernism that actually follows cubism and so on. It would have pointed on toward postmodernism in an interesting way. There was also an exhibition uh, in 1999 called Modern Starts. And for that exhibition, they put um, the Cezanne bather next to this photograph by Rinika Dijkstra called Odessa, Ukraine, August 4, 1993. 
Um, I assume, and again, I don't know if any of the discussions led up to this um, are available, but I assume that this reflected the, what was then the exponential expansion of photography into the fine art uh, market. And also, it made a nice formal parallel because both of these are kind of awkwardly uh, posed uh, figures. In the case of Renika Dykstra, she wanted these uh, figures. Um, she chose people and she wanted the photographs to look awkward. That was part of the, the, that was part of the meaning of these works. In the case of Cezanne, um, he wouldn't have said awkward, um, but it is, of course, um, awkward in relation to academic practices of his time. That's one of the, one of the salient characteristics of his practice that led on to his um, later style and then on to Cubism. So awkwardness was an appropriate thing to point to, and a bridge to photography was an interesting thing to do, but that was just a temporary exhibition. So back to 2010. Beyond the partition wall, once you've walked past the bather, uh, you were in a room which is circled right there, that the start of that room, where there were some popular favorites. And right on the back of that partition wall was Van Gogh's Starry Night. I, I took a bunch of the pictures for this section um, just off the internet and Flickr and Instagram and stuff because to, to try to capture what it was like, what it always what, what it was often like in those rooms, really crowded um, with people because these are the crowd favorites. I think a lot of museums, but maybe especially MoMA, um, are plagued uh, by the fact that they have uh, popular favorites that they, some of the curators, wish they could just put in storage uh, because they're actually not part of the narrative that they want to tell. And this is particularly the case uh, with the Museum of Modern Art, which has a number of these um, that they uh, used to hang all in this one room. Um, as if to say, okay, this is the stuff you're looking for, here it is, um, uh, but the real story continues elsewhere. Van Gogh is very um, central in popular histories of art, not at all central in the narrative that MoMA promoted and in the, in the books of the scholarship and the texts and so on that follow uh, the MoMA uh, model. Cezanne, on the other hand, is absolutely central in academic histories. Okay, so still in that room, but on the back wall on the right was Henri Rousseau's The Dream. Um, he was the most well-known of the untrained naive painters, as they used to call them, later called outsider artists uh, in Paris uh, before the First World War. Um, and he's for a long time been a popular favorite, um, partly because he's often been included in um, textbooks and introductions to modern painting. Um, and also partly because there's a, there's a, a tourist industry um, that has produced a lot of um, photographs, reproductions of this and other paintings. Come back to that in a second. Um, on the far back wall to the left of the Rousseau uh, was Marc Chagall's I and the Village from 1911. This is another artist that's traditionally um, not included in academic um, narratives of modernism, but very much included in popular narratives, along with uh, Chaim Soutin. Uh, they're both Jewish artists. Uh, they've been very widely popular through the mid 20th century and also in other countries. There was an important exhibition in China before the postmodern art market opened up of Chagall. Um, and in Chicago, we have the Four Seasons mosaic on Dearborn. It was a, it's an important acquisition because everybody in Chicago is interested in art knows Chagall, knew Chagall. Um, and on the left wall in the back of that same room was another Rousseau painting, The Sleeping Gypsy. This was also a popular favorite um, in the late 20th century. It used to be framed and put on people's walls, popular as a poster. It was a kind of a late 20th century equivalent of Millet's Angelus that you see at the bottom, which was very popular in color reproductions in the early 20th century. A kind of a bourgeois house ornament from the point of view of MoMA and something that they really could have done without because the narrative doesn't include it. So these and a couple of others that I didn't show were all there behind the partition wall in the unnumbered gallery. Um, just because um, they, I think the curators wanted to have them all in one place, not because they necessarily fit together or create a theme. But the serious narrative, the narrative that MoMA wanted to uh, foreground, continues off into gallery number two, because as soon as you passed the Cezanne bather, uh, passed its partition wall, as soon as you stood um, uh, opposite it, um, you would be able to look directly into gallery two. Um, and Picasso's Women of Avignon from 1907 
would be the image that you saw because it was positioned right there. So you'd see it directly as soon as you passed the, the uh, Cezanne bather. And this was the serious history of art um, because in the narrative um, uh, that's associated with MoMA and, uh, and this kind of, and this sense of modernism, Cezanne leads directly to Picasso, and this work is in the years immediately before Cubism, so it shows the bridge between them. You would then go into that room, and if you look to your right, then you would see behind another movable partition wall, this, um, this dead end, this area, and if you walked in there, you would see analytic Cubist paintings. These are the ones that followed the period of the Women of Avignon, so that Women of Avignon 1907, and the paintings in this gallery would be 1908, 9, 10, up through 1914 or so. So it's very interesting and appropriate that they were in a dead end there because they, Cubism has a peculiar position in this uh, narrative. It's absolutely essential as a cornerstone to modernism. A lot of the art of the 20th century is not conceivable without it. Um, and there were, there have been several studies of that showing its influence, but um, except for the decades immediately after um, analytic uh, cubism, the influence is not direct. Um, uh, it, this is not the kind of, this, this art didn't, um, didn't produce um, lineages of followers. So in a sense, it was a dead end. It was a, a moment of high experimentation a moment of crucial reconceptualization, a kind of consolidation of anti-academic um, interests um, and the definitive formulation of a new kind of pictorial language. Um, so it was necessary, but also a kind of dead end because art had to uh, go on from there, move around it. So it's, it's physically appropriate that it was in this uh, kind of cul-de-sac there. Once you finished looking at it, you would emerge, you'd walk back past the women of Avignon where the number, past the number two, on that diagram. You would realize you were, had been in a dead end and you would see that the way forward was toward gallery three. And standing in front of the Women of Avignon looking to your left, you would look through the opening and you would see on another partition wall, which is not shown in the MoMA plan, but it's right under the number three, you would see this, the three musicians. This is from the next phase of uh, Picasso's career now called synthetic cubism. Um, which he practiced in different ways through the 20s and, and onward. Um, and so this is, the, this is the way that the narrative leads onward to uh, surrealism and other uh, movements of the 20s and 30s. If you look to the left or right, like on the left-hand wall there, um, you would see minor cubists. So here's Juan Gris' Breakfast, and there's a, Czech, uh, a painting by a Czech artist, František Kupka, um, from 1910 to 11. But that, of course, again, would be a dead end. Um, so metaphorically or narratively or spatially or whatever, you would know that you, were, you needed to go on past three musicians. If you look directly behind you at that point on the, on the short walls that lead back toward uh, Gallery 2, um, they, they had hung uh, examples of Rayonism, which is Russian abstract art, including uh, this painting by Natalia Goncharova. Um, so the Russian avant-garde uh, is studied by art historians. It is a recognizable and expected specialty of larger art history departments. Um, sooner or later, an art history department will want to hire an expert in Russian cubo-futurism or in Russian uh, uh, avant-garde in general. But at the same time, it's expected, it is part of the narr narrative, but it is minor. In part, because it's outside of Western Europe and the main trajectory of modernism, um, but it was, it's also very close to um, um, ideological values uh, of modernism in the first couple of generations in the 20th century. So it's, it's always included, but it's sometimes parenthetical. And from there, the narrative dispersed because from there you could go in a number of different directions. There was, if I remember this um, installation right, um, there was abstract expressionism um, very close by, close enough so you could almost see it. I think it was in gallery nine, Pollock and others, gallery nine, 10, maybe seven. So that as soon as you got 
past the three musicians, if you looked, you could almost see it. You'd see two door openings leading down through five and six. So there was an implicit way to go, and you couldn't go very far wrong because there's, there aren't that many choices of places to go. So narrative was open, but at the same time, definitely led toward American abstract expressionism uh, in mid-century. So in 2010, the MoMA master narrative was still visible, but in a way that was after a while, after the first couple of galleries, really only legible for art historians. And especially if you weren't aware of the fact that there was a story to be told, you could easily think that they thought that Van Gogh's Starry Night and the Henri Rousseau's were also part of the story. In October 2019, uh, there was a new extension and renovation. Um, and uh, that was the moment that MoMA decided to um, finally um, renounce this master narrative that they had been known for since the 20s, since the 20s and 30s. So here's a page from the New York Times. The, the new hang um, got a front page review, which is really unusual, written by Holland Cotter, who's one of their uh, art critics. Um, so he wrote, quote, after decades of stonewalling multiculturalism, MoMA is now acknowledging it, even investing in it, notably in a permanent collection rehang that features art, much of it recently acquired, from Africa, Asia, South America, and African America, and a significant amount of work by women. And he illustrates here in the New York Times how the women of Avignon was then hung uh, across in a corner from a painting by the African-American artist Faith Ringgold, um, done in 1967. The uh, MoMA website um, had uh, some excerpts from an interview with, uh, with Faith Ringgold in which she talks about um, the, uh, the circumstances of the painting of that um, one called American People Series Number 20, Die. She says there was a lot of spontaneous rioting and fighting in the street and undocumented killings of African American people and great racism. It was amazing what was happening. So. The painting, hanging it next to the women of Avignon, um, corrected for MoMA a number of things at once. Uh, first of all, she's a woman, uh, African-American. The painting is about America, not Europe, so it brings the art back, you know, back to New York, and again, in a definitive way. Um, the painting is about politics, um, which um, Picasso's is not. Uh, her painting isn't sexist, which Picasso's is, because it's a picture of a brothel. Um, and as in that pairing between the Cezanne Bather and the Rinica Dijkstra photograph, this pairing is also apparently justified by formal similarities. They're both flat, multi-figure compositions. They both have non- or anti-academic poses and gestures and proportions. Um, and in this case, MoMA even uh, found another reason to put them together uh, because um, Ringgold uh, apparently has said, has said in another interview that she was influenced directly by Picasso's painting. Um, so MoMA had a lot of reasons to want to do this, all of them um, ways of signaling to the public that the um, no narrative of the sort that they had been promoting was any longer in place. Elsewhere in the new hang, there are a number of pairings like that. So there's the same Rousseau sleeping gypsy but in the fall of 2019, it was hung opposite a work by Zaha Hadid, who was an Iraqi-born artist. At the time, one of the things that MoMA was doing was um, intentionally representing artists from countries that had been included in President Trump's, tr President Trump's 29 travel ban uh, from Mideastern um, Islamic countries. So they were making a political statement as well. Here's another one of the uh, best known paintings in the Museum of Modern Art collection, Matisse's Red Studio, which has always been on display um, and is part of their master narrative of modernism. Um, it's a moment in which uh, Matisse, the principal, as it were, companion or you know, rival of Picasso, um, uh, in which he um, paints something that uh, approaches but never actually crosses the line into abstraction as Picasso himself had been doing, and also uh, weaves into the master narrative elements of um, decorative arts that um, Picasso didn't. For many different reasons, he fits the narrative. He's part of the, he's part of the story. Um, but here he's hung, he was hung opposite Alma Woodsy Thomas's Fiery Sunset. She was an African-American um, expressionist. It was painted around 1978. 
And of course, one of the reasons that they are put together is because they both um, red and black, almost monochromatic. Um, and uh, so MoMA continues to um, have an interest in formal similarities as a way of constructing narratives. Uh, but of course, in their earlier um, uh, periods, MoMA wouldn't have approved of this kind of comparison because it's um, not historical by the lights of the original um, narratives. So back to Holland Cotter's review for a minute. Um, that Ringgold-Picasso pairing, quote, he said, takes us back to its experimental early days, the museum's experimental early days, when American self-taught and non-Western art were on the bill. So just to bring back those four periods, Cotter is talking about the first period when Alfred Barr um, had the greatest influence um, and uh, in the 30s. Um, and when he did put in um, um, uh, Naive Art and others um, as, a, as a radical gesture against uh, contemporary museum practice. So actually what, what Cotter is saying is that the museum has regained some of a radicalism, a certain kind of radicalism that it had lost in the name of another kind of radicalism, this, this master narrative that they had been promoting. So just to keep the four periods on screen for one more screen. Cotter calls modernism's 2019 hang modernism plus. And he says, multiculturalism is now marketable. To ignore it is to forfeit profit, not to mention critical credibility. The new MoMA, and I put in brackets here, he means period four, what I'm calling period four. The new MoMA is obviously tailored to a new and younger audience, one that has no investment, nostalgic or otherwise, in the old pre-Taniguchi model, that would be number two, which now lives on, most, lives on mostly in the memories of a fading population, which itself had no memory of the original progressive 1930s museum, number one. So there's in a nutshell, in Cotter's uh, uh, view, um, the uh, good outcome of uh, getting rid of the narrative that had uh, been the central purpose of MoMA to promote for so many years by returning to its roots, as it were. MoMA has entirely given up the problem now um, by, um, by, uh, of including other modernisms by erasing their narrative, which allows anything to be included. Um, they've made this into a virtue by announcing, uh, and it remains to be seen if this will be true, uh, that they're going to entirely rehang the modern galleries every 18 months, so that even if there was a residue or a hint, a reminder of some of that older narrative, um, it would presumably be destroyed by successive rehangs every year and a half. So, in conclusion, you can watch for traces of the history of modern art in museums, um, including the Chicago Art Institute. Um, even museums that have very open floor plan almost always have echoes of the standard story of modernism um, that MoMA promoted um, in which Cezanne leads to Picasso, which leads to on to synthetic cubism and surrealism uh, and other movements. It has, the, it has a familiar, um, it, it's still familiar because it's still in textbooks, even though it's usually invisible in museums. So it is seemed very, it seemed very likely to me, given the fact that um, classes and curricula and textbooks and scholarship are still feeling the magnetic pull of this fundamental master narrative, it seems very likely that this narrative is still in the background of postmodern and contemporary art. But it exists mostly as echoes, as hints. It is also possible that art history has lost touch with what's happening um, and needs to rethink its dependence on stories completely. That's something which I'm going to be pursuing from now until the last of these history lectures.